Good afternoon, um, everyone. My name is Damon Johnson, the program manager for Georgia AIDS Education and Training Center. I have here my team, Ms. Marcilla Ryan Harris and Evan Pitts, who are both program coordinators for Georgia AIDS Education and Training Center, who will be serving as co-presenters for this presentation. Today, we'll talk to you a little bit about pre-exposure prophylaxis and historically black colleges and universities. So essentially exploring the role of HBCUs and the provision of PrEP services as well as uh, HIV prevention services. Um, so without further ado, we'll go ahead and give you our agenda. So today we'll do introductions again. I am Damon Johnson. Uh, Ms. Marcilla Ryan Harris will talk to you guys a little bit about HIV and youth just to give you the foundation of what we're working with here to kind of give us the background of why we started what we're doing. Next, we'll go to Mr. Evan Pitts. He'll talk a little bit about HBCUs and PrEP. What do we know? So he'll get into some of the things that we've learned throughout the years, some of the things that the data shows and suggests. Then I'll speak to you guys a little, about, a little bit about creating PrEP services at an HBCU, talk about some of the lessons learned, some of the things that we did at uh, a, a local college here in the Atlanta University Center. And then we'll summarize this and then we'll uh, save our questions and answers for the live presentation. And it is such an honor. And without further ado, I'll turn it over to um, Ms. Marcella Ryan Harris. But before I do, none of us have any disclosures. We're not uh, pushing any drugs or anything like that on today's webinar, our live presentation. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Again, my name is Marcella Ryan Harris, and I'm just going to briefly go through um, just some contextual data about HIV and youth and STIs. Next slide, please. So in 2018, there were about 37,832 new HIV diagnoses in the U.S. and its dependent areas. And this chart just shows the subpopulations that were most affected. So we see that um, when it comes to men, it is mostly through male-to-male -male sexual contact. And in women, it is heterosexual content, contact with Black and African-American women and men having the most new HIV diagnoses. Next slide. And when we look at new HIV diagnosis among men who sleep with men um, by age and race, we see that Black MSM aged 25 to 34 and Black MSM aged 13 through 24 make up the majority of new HIV diagnoses. Next. And this just shows um, of the new diagnoses in 2018, 21% were among youth aged 13 through 24. Next slide. And when we specifically look at youth 13 through 24 and transmission, method of transmission, we see that it is primarily through sexual contact. In young men, it is male to male sexual contact. And in young women, it is heterosexual contact, which if we go back to the first slide is um, consistent with the findings overall. Next. And this slide just shows that Although um, HIV diagnoses are impacting youth, we do see some progress being made and that diagnoses have decreased overall by 10% from 2010 through 2017. Um, but when you look at the charts below, you do see that some have decreased, um, subpopulations have decreased while others have increased or remained stable. But overall, there was a 10% decrease. Next. Um, of the youth who received an HIV diagnosis, um, only 36% received HIV care. Of those 36%, only 27% ret were retained in care and only 25% are virally suppressed. So I think that just goes to show that there's still a lot of work that needs to be done to make sure that um, once youth receive their diagnosis that they can get into care, stay into care and become undetectable. Next slide. And there are many unique factors that place youth at risk for STIs and HIV. Um, this includes insufficient screening, uh, confidentiality concerns, biology, lack of access to healthcare, and having multiple sex partners. And later in the presentation, we'll discuss how a lot of these factors also play a role on HBCU campuses. Next. And although youth um, only make up 27% of the sexually active population, they account for 50% or 10 million uh, cases of new STIs in the US each year. Next. And here just breaks down um, which STIs um, 
impact youth the most. So we see gonorrhea, chlamydia, HPV, genital herpes, HIV, and syphilis. Next slide. Thank you so much, Ms. Marcilla, for that amazing, uh, like you said, that foundation that we'll need. Um, next, we'll have Mr. Evan Pitts, who will talk a little bit about HBCUs and PrEP and what do we know currently. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Evan Pitts, and as Damon stated, I'll be speaking with you about uh, HBCUs and PrEP and some of the data that we found. Okay, so HIV in college campuses. Uh, I think we all have some idea of what college is like for young people. Uh, we were all young at uh, one point in our lives. We know that they experience freedom in all types of new ways. Uh, they deal with increased levels of stress and peer pressure, and they're faced with new uh, social scenarios involving temptation as well as experimentation. Uh, and this is where you will find things like alcohol, drugs, and sexual behavior being introduced. Uh, so we want to keep in mind that um, this is the age where these types of behaviors are common. So for a lot of them, this is the first time that they're away from home, uh, they're without their parents, so they're exploring. Uh, and this is the frame of mind that we operated from while conducting our research. Uh, it ensured that we were open to the process as well as prepared for any variance in response. Uh, next slide, please. So let's take a look at uh, HIV testing and risk behaviors on college campuses. In one study, low and or varying HIV testing rates were explored. The results from the first study yield a 29% prevalence of students uh, ever being tested. In the second study, we see that less than 40% had ever been tested. Uh, and age was the most significant factor associated with testing while race and anal sex were the least. In 2004, a study of freshmen at large public Mid-Atlantic University found that 42% had ever been tested for HIV. Uh, we know that HIV testing increased knowledge, but there was also this uh, underestimation of personal risk. And this was due to low perception of susceptibility for HIV and other STIs. Um, and this outcome kind of speaks to the STI data Marcella was speaking about a moment ago. Next, the intersections of HIV uh, with substance abuse, sexual violence, technology and criminalization were explored. So when we look at the intersections of HIV with substance abuse, uh, this encompasses the use of alcohol as well as prescription drugs, and those are very common among this group. Uh, and also as it relates to geosocial apps, this includes platforms like Instagram, Tinder, Facebook, Twitter, Jacked, Grindr, Christian Mingle, uh, the list goes on. Uh, and these platforms were, uh, are where we saw an increase. Next slide. Okay, HIV testing and risk behaviors on HBCU campuses. So in a behavioral survey conducted by the CDC at four Southern HBCUs, 58% visited their student health center in the last year, while only 43% reported testing within the last 12 months. Uh, what this tells us is that the students felt like they finally had somewhere to go where they could receive, uh, you know, health and address their healthcare needs. Uh, we saw that testing was most likely associated with older age, um, identifying as bisexual, living off campus uh, and an increase in the number of sexual partners. 14% uh, of sexually, black, sexually active black female students reported having sex with bisexual men uh, within the previous 12 months. Uh, and they were more likely to have uh, more than or at the very least two partners uh, within that year, as well as unprotected sex during their last encounter. Um, and then we see that uh, more than 50% of these women believed that they were at low risk for HIV which kind of speaks to an opportunity for increased engagement in education. Next slide, please. HIV stigma on college campuses. Uh, it exists on multiple levels. Uh, this includes students living with HIV on campus who experienced discrimination, exclusion from social groups, and vulnerability in healthcare, health insurance, as well as social support. Uh, when we looked at the general student body, we found relationships between HIV testing, knowledge, and stigma, and that there were certain vulnerable groups uh, who had higher HIV knowledge. Uh, negative perceptions about people living with HIV have decreased, but are still present, which denotes uh, you know, progress as well as an opportunity to educate. Uh, stigma with the healthcare providers, we saw that there was a lack in cultural competency, 
uh, and also uh, you know, pervasive undertones of religiosity uh, that would often be in the form of like microaggressions uh, or sometimes just an a subjective opinion, uh, both of which can lead to students not returning for services. Next slide, please. Uh, intersection of multiple social stigmas. So we looked at racism, sexism, misogyny, homophobia, and classism. And we also looked at intersecting oppressions inclusive of gender, class, race, uh, religion, nationality, abilities, and sexual orientation. Next slide. Thank you, Mr. Pitts. Um, so a little bit about what both presenters shared prior to me is uh, basically laid the foundation for what we um, implemented for strategies for change and some of the things that we recognized when we were conducting our, um, our personal research as well as secondary data analysis so that we can kind of frame our approach. So what we realized is that in order for us to change the existing climate on college and uh, college university health center settings as well as the campus, we had to create town and gown partnerships for testing. A lot of HBCUs in the Southeast particularly do not offer HIV testing and STI testing as a routine part of healthcare services. So what we realized is that when we did our, uh, 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 a survey of the schools throughout the Southeast region, what we recognized is that a lot of schools, like I said, did not offer these things. So what we had to do is we had to figure out what were some of the reasons that schools were not offering uh, HIV and STI test testing. And what we realized is that a lot of it had to do with capacity issues from a personnel standpoint, as well as resources. So what we had to determine is how do we best integrate these services and how do we best offer these things? So what we found is that town and gown partnerships were key for those that were offering these services. And so when we began, um, at the local university and the Atlanta University Center, they did not have the resource and or the staff capacity. So what we had to do was work in, um, externally to figure out because there were a lot of organizations around the school in the immediate setting that were offering testing that were willing and able to complete these testing, this testing for us, but also they had the resources while we work intensively to really, really, really build the capacity of the existing staff on the University Health Center to, uh, to break down some of those barriers, such as the stigma that Mr. Pitts talked about, such as the victim blaming that is often done, like these young kids are just not listening or they're just running wild, but understanding that contextually, this is the time for them to explore. So what we had to do is figure out best, the best way to do this. And we realized that those town and gown partnerships were key. But the integration of services was really important too. We realized that sex doesn't exist in the vacuum and neither does HIV exist in the vacuum. So what we had to do is like they talked about earlier, those factors that contribute to youth being at increased risk of HIV, such as substance abuse and mental health um, were so key because when you think about it, stigma can often lead to sickness as well as substance abuse can often lead to your increased risk of engaging in behaviors that you probably normally would not in, engage in. So what we had to do is partner across the aisle and create a strategic plan that included both the substance abuse and the mental health departments on campus. So if a student came in and they said that I'm having an issue with substances or a student came in and said, hey, I'm drinking a little more, more than I need to, or, or if an RA has found alcohol or drugs in a person's room multiple times, it was um, introduced at that time that, hey, we need to go ahead and figure out what are the what are their behaviors when they're under the under the influence or when they're engaging in these uh, uh, these behaviors that can put them at increased risk because we do know that there is a relationship that exists, but we also realized that we um, needed to utilize that space when we had the mental health things going on those those adjustment disorders like I'm away from home. Um, I don't necessarily know what I'm, I'm getting my first taste of freedom. I don't necessarily know what it is that I do like sexually. I'm going to try this. I'm going to try that to teach them how to do those things, but also social marketing strategies. In order to reduce the stigma, we had to kind of integrate um, HIV testing and STI testing into the existing infrastructure um, that was already there. So we had to tailor uh, our approaches to fit the populations that we we're serving. So when we're looking at marketing HIV testing services and STI testing services, you have to meet the students where they are. You could not try to create, oftentimes we go on and we try to create events, um, testing events that compete or compete on or impede on students existing structure. So students are on campus to be students first and then 
they also are on campus to figure out who they are becoming. So as they're coming into their own, they, if you have an event going on here and an event that is a popular event, such as a homecoming event, instead of trying to create a separate event, partner with the, 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 the campus organizations, partner with the departments on campuses to figure out how do we integrate HIV testing and prevention messaging and services in what is already existing. So the role of HBCUs in social change has always been very, very, very pivotal. HBC, HBCUs were pioneers in the social justice movements. Um, when we think about the civil rights movement here in Atlanta, a lot of the schools in the Atlanta University Center were key and instrumental to really moving the needle during the civil rights movement. So what we have to do is we have to position HBCUs and uplift them and affirm them from that space. And we have to frame HIV as a social justice issue because this disease or this, this virus disproportionately impacts uh, people of color. And if you look at youth between the ages of 15 and 24, it is really um, impact in this age group and we can really shape or reshape the existing narrative. So what we have to do is build on that and build on the space uh, of build on the space of, hey, HBCs, you, are, you guys already, you have this. So build from the space that they're comfortable with, that you have this, you have the leadership a model that, that already exists. How do we include HIV? How do we include the isms that are disproportionately impacted by this, this epidemic? And you guys build from that space. So we look at civic engagement, health equity, but social media campaigns and advocacy for underrepresented populations. And again, most HBCUs already have this infrastructure because they were born and they were and they were born and they thrive off of the whole social justice and being pioneers for social justice. So if you build from that space and you empower them from that space and figure out how do we best package HIV or how do we best pack, package sexual health disparities in a way in which they can own this and be leaders in this space as well because they already have that uh, leadership experience, but they just need to know how do we frame this as a issue for us so that it's not frightening. So some of the opportunities with PrEP in the college health setting, what we realize is that um, we had to encourage health access and follow up at an early age. So if you incorporated PrEP, what we, what we found is that you were introducing to students health decision-making behaviors. So what we found is that most of the students who um, did decide that they wanted to be on PrEP or were interested in PrEP or were interested in HIV prevention services or sexual health prevention services, we were encouraging students to now who, for the first time in their lives, are making healthcare decisions on their own because they don't have their parents to schedule appointments or they don't have their parents to remind them to go to an appointment or they don't have their parents to say, hey, you probably need to get a refill. This was something that students were um, having to learn on their own. So at the beginning, there is a level of coddling and handholding that must exist. However, this is great because you're creating that foundation for great and positive health uh, decision-making behaviors um, down the line. But also, it, we, we found that it was early sexual health empowerment messaging, uh, giving students the space to understand that, hey, sexual, sex is natural, sex is normal, but also owning their sexual uh, experience and their sexual journeys. So with this, um, with this, with prep, introducing prep into the student health setting, these are some of the things and some of the messages that you can uh, convey to um, uh, the student health centers and a number of other decision makers on campus. Because what this does is that say, "Hey, this is your sexual journey. How do we best support you along this journey?" So this is something that is really important and that um, can really change the uh, outcomes of students along among your campus. But also education on insurance, student health fees, etc. Um, all students see a student health fee on their, their student health account, but most times they do not know what this encompass or what this includes. So what this gives us the opportunity to do is to kind of train students at an early age to be able to determine, okay, what am I paying for? Or what do I get from uh, this thing? But also to take control of their health and understand that sexual health is a part of your overall health because they do uh, sexual health does have implications on your overall health in general, both mental and physical, but also education on insurance. Um, and this is so important um, now more than ever. Um, educating students on how insurance premiums were, how explanation of benefits were, and what some of these things are because post graduation, most students will have to figure this out on their own. Because again, when we we're on our parents' insurance early on, these aren't things that are discussed with us. So when we do have uh, this, this opportunity to start forming these behaviors and forming these 
relationships with insurance companies, with our providers and things like that, we kind of understand how we prepare them for what the world will be like because there is no class that teaches you these things um, pre or post college. So this is a great opportunity here where and prep can introduce that on campus, but also convenience. Um, a lot of times students don't have the, the, the flexibility and or the means or resources to get outside of campus. So this offering prep and preventative health services on campus oftentimes gives is convenient for students and it gives them more um, it encourages them more to take control of their health in general because it's convenient. However, we'll talk a little bit about how sometimes these structures can, how sometimes these structures can also serve as barriers because most of the times student health centers are only open between the hours of 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. And those are the hours that students are expected to be in class, our students are expected to be students. So we have to make sure that our, our sexual health programs and our student health centers often meet the needs of the students and that, are, that they reflect the true hours of students. But also more, more robust routine HIV and STI screening. Um, this routinizes this for students because oftentimes what, we, what you find in student health or in general is that HIV and STI testing is episodic. Most of the times the students come in after they have an episode, but when you uh, streamline PrEP into uh, your student health center or, or HIV testing into your student health services, what you find is that students become more comfortable and they're now in control of their own sexual health. And now they feel empowered to do more and to uh, seek testing on a more routine basis because they're not afraid and they understand the process or they've created relationships with people that are, are already in the student health center. But also it gives us the opportunity to research because oftentimes we're making decisions based on what we believe or based on research that is so dated that um, we're not pivoting and we're not adjusting or creating solutions that are relevant and or tailored to the current time. So what we have to realize is that oftentimes when we're doing this testing or we're introducing prep into a college health setting, what you'll find is that it gives us the opportunity to ask questions, to probe, to listen, to learn from the experts, because what you have to understand is what we have to understand when providing services for any group or specifically for students is that they're the experts. So we have to learn from them. They are the experts. We have to make sure that they are doing what necessarily needs to be done. Some of the unique considerations of prep in the college health settings where it's hectic and unpredictable schedules. So again, students are not on a fixed schedule. So when we have this eight to five model, that may not work because if a student has class from uh, nine to six, then you can't ever expect them to come in. So these hectic and unpredictable schedules um, are, are, is gonna be key and we'll touch on that. But also emerging adulthood and fluid identities. Uh, oftentimes, like I said, when, you fit, when students are first going onto campus, many have not even tried or explored with sex, but some are trying things to figure out what is it that I enjoy? What is it that I like? Because now they have that freedom to try things or they're being pressured or they're being encouraged to try this or try that or hey, I did this. So those are the type of external factors that now come into play that will make a person or a student feel like, hey, I want to try this. So we have to be willing and ready to pivot based on what the students are doing currently in the current moment. And a lot of that comes from those external things like media and things like that. Those things kind of shape what students are trying as well. Summer's off. So when you think about prep or introducing prep into the uh, student health setting, what do we do when students are away from co the college campus? How do we address their needs still? How do we make sure that there's continuity? How do we continue prep services? How do we still be a, a, uh, a pillar or how do we still be a resource for students during these times? But what we have to understand just because students are off doesn't necessarily mean that we are off. So when you're creating a program, a prep program or a sexual health program, create a program that truly meets the needs of students. Create a program that addresses some of these unique considerations when thinking about um, Prep and what we'll talk about is we created a manual that kind of talks about some of these things that we'll be introducing in August. But stay tuned, but make sure when you're considering prep in college health settings that these are some of the things that you're thinking about. But also insurance, labs, explanation of benefit, uh, explanation of benefits and confidentiality challenges. These are things that are so, 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 so real. Again, most students don't know about insurance. Most students have never received the explanation of benefits. Most students don't want their parents to know that they're having sex, let alone coming in for HIV testing services. 
or most students don't want their parents figuring out that, hey, I'm going in to get PrEP, which is something that is a technically a HIV medication if a parent looks it up. And now you have to worry about parents assuming that a child, their child has HIV or their child is just out running wild or whatever the case is. We have to make sure that we're building from this space that we're understanding that, hey, let us call um, or let us negotiate with our insurance companies early on so that we can make sure that if a student comes in for a visit that it just says, general health visit or something like that so that students um, and their parents aren't receiving their total explanation of benefits because although they may be on their parents insurance the explanation of benefits um, actually belongs to the students and so that's something that we learned along the way and what students can do is that they can actually request the explanation of benefits to be redirected because at the end of the day HIPAA is real and HIPAA protects the students from this. But also, like I said, these are some of the unique considerations what to think about because lab costs and things like that can become a challenge. But also students need handholding. It takes a certain temperament. Understand that students, this is the first time, like I said, for a lot of them. So what we have to understand is that, hey, instead of us getting angry or upset, or we expect that a, a certain level of coddling and handholding because we're training them to become um, emerging adults so they don't know a lot of these things so this is their first introduction to these things so although we're providing health care we also have to provide a level of health literacy as well as insurance literacy as well but limitations of nine to five student health services uh, again we have to understand that if we expect students to be students first we have to make sure that the hours and the structures that we have created do not serve as a deterrent to uh, just health in general, because not only just sexual health, but just health in general, because what we saw is that um, the university that we were working with had an increased number of their premium were kept going up year by year, semester by semester because of increased uh, ER and urgent care visits. But that and for simple things such as HIV testing or a gonorrhea treatment or something like that, and students were utilizing emergency rooms and urgent cares, but that's because after four o'clock after I get out of class, okay, I don't think about the student health center. I'm going to get lunch. I'm going to socialize. I'm going to do this, or I don't want to go in there and wait. So we have to figure out how do we make sure that we're taking as many limits off as possible. Um, college health and prep. So what we do know is that OCHA's statement on preps, there were some guidelines and recommendations introduced in 2019. Um, many students, uh, student health centers offering prep on, and advertise on their website. So there are a lot of students uh, health centers that are around the world, um, around the U.S. that are offering PrEP and they do advertise those on their, their website. HBCUs demonstra demonstrate knowledge and interest in PrEP. Um, and that is from a study that uh, Dr. Parker did in 2018. So there's an interest that exists there. However, there's a level of fear. There's a level of stigma that exists because of a number of things, historical things, in the, um, specifically in the Black community that we have to work through. So when we determine or when we're working through this to build a program, we have to take into consideration some of those unique things. But also there's little research on prep awareness, interest, and uptake on college campuses. So again, Creating a robust program that uh, sexual health prevention program allows us to do a number of things. So what we have to do is we have to make sure that we're um, taking into account a lot of the things that's going to be new and novel and they're, they're going to evolve with time. So um, some of the steps that we took to creating prep services at HBM, we took quotes. So we did a number of focus groups. Dr. Mel Branch, David Mel Branch was instrumental in uh, a lot of the work that we did. He was the only provider there. He did, he also worked at U University of Penn 2012 to 2015. And so um, uh, although some people look at PrEP as, okay, if we introduce PrEP, students won't use condoms. But what, some of the quotes from students there, I actually do use condoms more now because they understood the role of condoms. Uh, PrEP gave some students peace of mind. Um, they considered it their gay vitamin. Um, they, were, they were not as worried if they slipped up because those are things that have happened, that these are things that happen. Um, and it's like a birth control. And so students, these are some of the views and quotes from students that were that. So the current student health services at AUC, uh, each and every of the, uh, all of the schools have their own independent student health centers. However, um, Morehouse School of Medicine uh, most recently undertook a project on Lee Street that we're calling the Lee Street Clinic that seeks to bring all of these student health centers under one roof 
um, under one roof to provide comprehensive healthcare services throughout the Atlanta University Center, also to coordinate our efforts throughout the Atlanta University Center. Those things are going really well. We have a few of the schools that are already signed on. I know Morehouse College will be moving under that roof. Um, Clark Atlanta will be moving under that roof and Spelman College will be doing some after hour services currently at that roof and Morehouse School of Medicine will be there as well. Spelman College has a wellness center as well as well as a student health center. So these are the current student health centers. So some of the unique health contexts for HBCU students is diverse lived experience, chronic diseases, family trauma, mental health, black affirmation, religion and spirituality. All of these intersections and contexts make student health are providing services to students on these campuses very unique um, in itself. So we have to think about when we're developing the program that this program can't exist in vacuum. You can't say that I want to provide sexual health services, but ignore family trauma or ignore mental health or ignore their lived experience, that whole black affirmation piece, all these diverse lived experiences that multiple people will become from some various backgrounds. And you can't create a solution, this one size fits all solution that you have to constantly evaluate your efforts. You have to constantly survey the lay of the land. You have to constantly check the temperature of the campus that you're serving, because this is gonna be very, very, very vital for you to create a program that's sustainable and thriving. So some of the voices from the students, in order for us to do what we did, we realized that we had to do a number of focus groups to determine what were the knowledge, attitudes, beliefs, and practices of the students on campus in order for us to create a, um, uh, a comprehensive program. So we conducted 12 focus groups in, the, in 2018 and 2019, three at each of the AUC campuses, Morehouse School of Medicine, Morehouse College, Clark Atlanta, and Spelman College. 21 students participated from each campus, totaling a number of 84 students altogether. And we explored current experiences, future, and future health wants. So some of the primary emerging themes were desire for personal connection and security. Students wanted to be treated as an individual and students wanted to be secure. Students didn't want to walk inside of a student health center and feel like they were being judged because they were coming in for a condom. Or if a young lady wanted to come in for prep, she didn't want to feel like someone thought that she was a promiscuous. So if a young man came in for prep services, he didn't want to necessarily feel like, hey, I'm already being judged or labeled as a gay man. So we wanted to figure out how do we create a uh, personal connections and security, but also endorse increased student involvement in the new health center. So students want to be involved. If you're creating a health center for us or a program for us that seeks to address our health systems, then hey, this needs to be for us. We need to be involved every step of the way. Um, strongly encourage staff sensitivity and inclusivity training. Most of the time, student health center makeups are, are nurses and or providers that um, are old enough to be the, the parents and or guardians of a lot of the students. So it's a little bit difficult for students to walk in and talk to their parent about sex or talk to their aunt or uncle about sex. So it's important for us to make sure that we're sensitive and we're inclusive. And no matter what our own views are, we have to leave our baggage at the door and make sure that we're coming in to provide a service every day that addresses the needs and the primary health concerns, both mental and sexually for students on campus, but also quality care, access to staff, expanded hours, a secure health portal, because students didn't want to have to come in and get their health, uh, their health records if they didn't need to. But they also want an integration of health services if it was like Woody. And Woody is the library that all the schools share in the Atlanta University Center. So expanding PrEP to Morehouse College. So PrEP became available at Morehouse College in November 2017. Um, Dr. Young, who's an amazing professor at uh, Morehouse College, she did a study to figure out what were the knowledge, attitudes, and beliefs of college students attending an all-male HBCU regarding sexual health, sexual orientation, HIV. There was two focus group, three focus groups here as well, one interview with, uh, and one interview with health, the student health clinic staff. So some of the qualitative findings include that Morehouse College students receive sexual health information from their peers and social media before health professionals. And again, this goes back to what we talked about earlier. The messenger is just as important as the message, but also we have to understand when creating a program, we have to tailor it to the actual needs of the students. And oftentimes what you'll find is that students aren't coming to health professionals to get information. They already have their minds made or formed prior to coming in. But sexual orientation can serve as both a deterrent and as a motivator for adopting PrEP. So make sure that you uh, are looking at your target audience. But also PrEP stigma and shaming was real. So a lot of students felt like if I got on PrEP or once they started PrEP, if 
their partner or their significant other or interest came over, they say, okay, you're a prep whore or this Juvada whore. That was real for a lot of students. So it created the prep closet where many students were afraid or if they were on PrEP, they kind of got into the closet because they didn't want to be judged. But lack of immediate access to a healthcare provider, perceived adverse visits with a healthcare provider, and the institution's attitudes toward uh, LGBTQIA plus uh, community influences how students perceive and, stigma, uh, perceive and stigmatize sexual health and HIV prevention services. So this is important, again, that you make sure that you're constantly checking the temperature of the current and existing environment and that you're often looking to figure out how do I build a program that is truly reflective of the needs of the students and it also has student involvement and meaningful involvement of students. But some of the next steps that we felt like we needed to do is that we had to do additional student and administration focus groups that, that, will, that will be conducted. We developed a survey for students and faculty that will go out for each semester so that we can constantly be aware of uh, what we had going on, but also we had to increase the capacity for um, the institution to provide services, increase coordination with off-campus service providers, increase care coordination for students who tested positive, because if you're testing more, you have to expect a kind of buffer for the positivity rate, or, and we had to increase PrEP awareness on campus, because many students during those focus groups did not know PrEP was an option, what it was, and or if it was for them. So Morehouse College PrEP services, again, it began late 2017. We expanded in 2018. I was a sexual health educator and I was instrumental in developing a lot of the policies and protocols with Dr. Mel Branch, who was the only PrEP prescriber. Um, we had PrEP protocols, we developed PrEP protocols for nurses so that we had a nurse-led model that was uh, created to meet the needs of the students on campus. Um, because our uh, budget was limited, we did realize that we would not be able to house PrEP in-house because it was just too expensive, so we had to create partnerships with existing pharmacists. We created a partnership with Walgreens Community Pharmacists, who was very knowledgeable about patient assistance programs, who was very knowledgeable about uh, HIV, stigma, and all these different things because they were a community pharmacy but was backed by Walgreens. So that was very key because they brought over the drugs to students so students didn't have to leave campus. Um, there was a courier service and they also mailed the uh, prep prescriptions to students during breaks and things like that. So this was very instrumental into us um, having that HR limitations. Students had cell phones of, uh, of the educators and providers because we did not have an ER, uh, EHR system that allows students to check a portal and things like that. So you have to give students options and ways to get in touch with you um, when you were closed or you were not no longer uh, available. But we also had administrative barriers. There were multiple. Um, we can go into these, but it will be uh, uh, we would need a whole nother presentation to actually go into some of the administrative barriers, but you have to be willing to address those things and challenge those things to create a program and we can talk offline about how do you do that. So in order for us to do that, we created a campaign with a local nonprofit uh, above the status quo uh, that was entitled They Give a Fuck, which was free comprehensive knowledge, a global campaign that seeks to educate, engage, and empower young people in the prevention of HIV. So on 61 days, we tested 421 students in the AUC and we got 22 newly diagnosed HIV positive students. But before we can go into that, we had to figure out what was the profile of students. So meet James Williams. This is a fictitious character. He was popular on the HBCU campus, and he's a part of that 55% of young people, um, HIV positive African Americans. Um, so a lot of the things that he uh, felt like that put him at greater risk was stigma, access, and awareness. He was unaware that HIV was relevant to him because a lot of the marketing tools address, uh, a lot of the marketing tools and images were for people that were gay, bisexual men, or if he went into the student health center, he felt like if he asked for comments, people want to know why were you back again to get more comments and just access because of the hours. So we, we had to figure out how do we figure out how do we change this? So what James and people like James wanted was free, flexible, and confidential access to HIV prevention tools and information. So how do we create a campaign that addressed that or how did we create a program that included those things that James and others like James wanted? We realized that we had to raise awareness. So we shared videos using Instagram stories and HIV facts and infographics. So we had to use the meme culture and things like that to really 
grab the, 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 the eyes and grab the attention of students so that they could be engaged and educated in what the messaging that we were trying to do. But again, we had to partner with campus organizations to kind of make sure that the messages that we were trying to convey and that we were trying to mobilize were encompassed by everybody on campus. We had to go to those gatekeepers. But we also had to create a, a website, HIV, AIDS, and Statistics, um, online and offline resource kits, um, and access points to free services by zip code. So students knew what were their options on and off campus, but also that they created a, a lifestyle change and that they looked at HIV as no longer as a silo issue, but more so as a lifestyle change. But also we had to figure out how do we continuously engage them. So we had to create an e-newsletter, uh, collegiate chapters, and we also had to create a challenge, which was the power of three, where each one, when you learn something, you teach three people and you challenge those three people to teach another three people. So if you learn about HIV testing in the hours on campus, then let uh, three other people know. If you learn about our free condom distribution program, let three other people know and ask them to let three other people know. If you learn about prep on demand or prep, um, delivery services, you let three people know. So we had to figure out how do we constantly engage them and create events that were not solely embedded or just everything was HIV, 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 but more so. Here's an event. We know that the alphas on campus is having an event. So how do we partner? Instead of saying we're going to go in and talk to people, let's create a step show that utilizes all Greek to, to create a stroll and or skit around HIV prevention, whether it was condom use or whatever. And then we create, and we give you guys a prize based on um, whoever has the most creative idea and the most original idea and the most educative and informative idea. But our response was a social media ad campaign, a website, we created a logo. And then from this data and from some of the already data that we had from the focus groups, from the secondary data analysis, from the testing pilot, we created a routine HIV testing program that included comprehensive STI testing and structural interventions such as condom distribution, a, a locker box that students could order condoms throughout the day and pick up those condoms um, at a later time. We expanded our sexual health services hours, but also we made awareness as a lifestyle. We looked at how do we create HIV and STI awareness as a lifestyle? How do students adopt this as a lifestyle? And that's what we did. We kind of really, really, really reshaped what we were doing and how we were doing it. And students started looking at this in a different way and we saw in, uh, uptake in the increase in HIV testing and prevention services just in general. So some of the future considerations is that um, we continue prep access at Morehouse College and MSM around administrative barriers. So we're gonna to continue to work around some of those things. Um, investigate innovative approaches, so telehealth and alternate delivery systems. Um, also, the new University Health Center that we spoke about earlier, it opens um, later this year. So that will be easier because we, it will eliminate some of the other barriers that were existing working against three administrations um, or three different student health centers and things like that and splitting resources and a number of other things, but also the potential for sexual health expansion for all the schools in the AUC. So we're looking at how do we create a coordinated response and this um, new health center will kind of help with that. And we'll leave you with this note that uh, was on one of the student health center uh, doors um, in the AUC is that sexual health concerns are seen by appointment only, walk-ins are for emergencies only. And what we want to end here with is just that sexual health concerns um, are part of your health care. So we have to be um, careful how we frame sexual health services and um, how we see them. And we have to make sure that we include them and we understand their sexual health is a part of your overall health. So with, uh, with no, uh, so without that, we can't, we, 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 we serve as a barrier so as, or as a deterrent. So we have to be careful how we frame these things. Um, my name is Damon Johnson. Again, the team is Marcella Ryan Harris and Evan Pitts. And we thank you for this opportunity and we thank you for your time. We look forward to sharing our HBCU implementation toolkit, um, uh, which was our MEI project for the Southeast AIDS Education and Training Center. And we entitled it No Progress Without Us, uh, which is a roadmap for HBCUs, the role of HBCUs in HIV, uh, the role of HBCUs in ending the HIV epidemic. So thank you guys for your time. We look forward to sharing this resource with you all in September. Thanks. Good morning. Uh, my name is Lance Okeke. I'm from Duke University, and I'm here with uh, Dr. Kenrick Ware from South University in Columbia, South Carolina. 
Um, we would like to talk today about um, engaging HBCUs in HIV prevention. Um, thank you for giving us the opportunity to um, talk um, on our, um, about our partnership that we forged over the last three years. And I think it's important to mention that um, none of the partners in this project have any disclosures. Um, so we'll go ahead and start. Um, so we're going to talk um, briefly just about an um, introduction about who we are, um, and then, then talk about the history of our partnership over the last three years, initiative goals, um, an overview of the HIV prevention research module um, um, crafted by the, by the Legacy Project over the, um, over the last five years, um, and really the centerpiece of our HIV prevention partnership strategy. And then our next steps as we start to move to um, uh, HBCU campuses in South Carolina to deliver customized or really develop customized HIV prevention strategies in conjunction with the, um, in conjunction with the uh, universities and really the key stakeholders on those campuses. Um, and then, of course, um, there'll be room for questions and answers uh, later in the in the hour. So, um, just by way of introduction, I'm Lance Okeke, and I'm an assistant professor of medicine and division of infectious diseases at Duke University Health System. Um, I have an interest in um, HIV prevention as an HIV specialist and as a clinical researcher. Um, and also, I'm also a graduate of a, a historically black college and university, and so this topic, although not my primary area of research. Um, had um, particular interest um, to myself and and um, as a um, someone that looks would look to advance towards our push um, towards ending the HIV epidemic. Um, I partnered with uh, Dr. Kenrick Ware, who is an associate professor in the Department of Pharmacy Practice at South University of Columbia. And we'll talk a little bit more about why this partnership um, happened organically and naturally, and it was very complementary to our um, our goals um, going forward. Um, but um, we're happy to have Kenrick on our team. Um, we also have partners at the HIV Network Coordination Center um, and based out of um, um, Fred Hutchinson in Seattle. Um, and uh, Russell Campbell is a um, Hank Deputy Director in the Office of HIV AIDS Network Coordination. And Louis Shackelford is a Project Man Manager for the Legacy Project, which is embedded within Hank. So we'll talk a little bit more about their involvement um, and they'll be available for um, questions and answers at the end of this session as well. Um, so just a little bit about Hank. So um, the mission of Hank, the HIV AIDS Network Coordination, is uh, to really kind of put together, um, bring together um, large groups of uh, um, um, networks based in clinical trials in a number of um, realms within the HIV um, epidemic. And so we have the ACTG, which is um, focused on the treatment of adults in the clinical trials in adults, um, IMPACT, um, HIV Vaccine Trials Network, um, HPTN, and the MTN. So Hank brings all these groups together to ensure cross-network coordination for critical activities uh, among these big um, trials groups. Within their jurisdiction as well, however, is to strategically partner with um, in investigators that are aligned with the missions of Hank. Um, and that's how we got involved um, with the Legacy Project, which is part of the community coordination um, uh, section of Hank. And so they partnered with us graciously, and they've been very helpful in, in the implementation of our initiatives uh, going forward. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about how that all came to be. Um, I am a member of uh, the local um, Duke uh, Center for AIDS Research. Um, many of you on the, on the session may know that the Center for AIDS Research are um, our center is um, funded by the NIH and the, and the NIAID um, to really bring together investigators and in, in strategic academic institutions around the country to uh, um, coordinate, to augment, and to really facilitate um, cutting-edge HIV research in these kind of centers of, um, of um, academic uh, thought um, leadership. And so um, Duke has a, a CFAR, and I've been a member of the Duke CFAR for the last five years. And their, their support for our activities has been instrumental in, in getting uh, things uh, going um, from, the, from the level of our partnership. And so we're appreciative. And really, the CFAR was really the platform on which we were able to actually make all these connections across institutions between Duke Health, South University, and the Legacy Project. And so I, um, with, uh, with support from a CFAR grant, I was able to um, connect with the North Carolina AIDS Training and Education Center. Um, and, you know, 
didn't really have a plan initially when I started to um, conceive this in late 2015, early 2016. But I spoke with some investigators at North Carolina, at the University of North Carolina, and it's like, you know, um, there are little things that we can do right now with relatively little funding to uh, ensure that HBCUs, hubs of young um, um, African Americans, um, many of them who would fall into risk factors for um, um, new HIV infections, I think as most people know, um, um, African Americans account for half of all new HIV infections around the country. Um, African Americans in the South are a particular risk as the South accounts for half of all new infections around the country as well. These seem like natural um, entry points to really kind of make the dent in terms of like HIV prevention and um, really increasing and advancing the dissemination of um, HIV prevention strategies um, in strategic places. And so we, 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 were, we were fortunate here in Durham, North Carolina to be within um, 50 miles of uh, five of the largest HBCUs around the country. North Carolina a and is the largest um, historically black college in the country, and that's about 50 miles away in Greensboro, North Carolina. We have North Carolina Central, Fayetteville State, and Shaw University in Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, and so we just said, you know, let's kind of act as um, um, advocates for capacity building. You know, let's, let's really kind of do the needs assessments on the student health clinics on these campuses and see how we can streamline the incorporation of HIV prevention services into their, into their clinics. So that's what we did. Um, we visited the student health clinics on all these four campuses. We spoke with their um, with key stakeholders, providers, wellness counselors, um, student health groups involved with the student health centers on these campuses. And, um, and we came up with a strategy for how to best streamline um, PrEP and PrEP incorporating PrEP into their campus. And this is an a example of one of the schematics we came up with. In this case, you can see this is Bronco Blue and Yellow for Fayetteville State University. And it says, here's how, based on what we've seen on your clinic, we're actually going to implement a prep strategy to work them um, to fit with your busy workflow within the student health clinic. Um, and so this is what we did. And we did this four times over um, at Shaw, at Fayetteville State, at North Carolina Central, and North Carolina a and um, It was very well received and um, still in constant contact with uh, the healthcare directors, other the clinic directors at these student health centers, and they're grateful for, for this. Um, at the same time, we wanted to kind of get a little bit more student engagement and get a sense for where the students were on HIV um, prevention and PrEP. You know, the very, um, on a fundamental level, the, the students know that there is a once daily pill that was 92 to 99% effective in preventing HIV when taken correctly. Did they know, and if they didn't know, how can we fill those gaps of knowledge within this critical student population? And so um, here are some representative pictures um, of what we did. We went to the campuses and we just talked to students. We gave them information. We gave them pamphlets. We gave them um, swag. So we have t-shirts here and lanyards and, and all kinds of cool stuff. And every time they would come up, we would just talk to them, you know, and, and the students were very responsive. This was actually within the Student Health Center building on one of our campuses we visited. And um, it was a great turnout and, and every four. We went to health um, fairs as well. So um, healthy lifestyle fairs on campuses and students came out and they were having their food and they were having um, the music in the background and we had a booth there and we just talked to students about prep. And, um, and so here are some of the materials we got because one thing we also did was partner with key student health groups um, on campuses. So, and so see, you see um, and this is one example from North Carolina Central University um, for uh, a group uh, there really ran by their student health center wellness program called Project Safe. Um, Project Safe essentially um, had um, had the prime uh, initiative of promoting um, sexual health on campus. Um, this was a very organic, uh, um, relatively poorly funded um, group on campus, uh, just of interested and concerned uh, students um, with the back end of the student health center. And they've been doing this work for a long, long time, but PrEP wasn't really a big part of their, uh, of their program. And so we decided to kind of take up that mantle and, um, and make sure that they were incorporating that into their messaging to students on campus. And so um, here are just some of the, um, the swag. We got them t-shirts. We gave them bags full of uh, condoms and information on PrEP. Um, we gave them, um, we made posters for them um, through our grant to kind of post around campus and 
key um, high traffic areas. And then the last thing, which I think I want to emphasize as we talk, go forward, we're going to talk about, we encourage them to really help us angle the messaging for PrEP and other HIV prevention based on their local context. And so the poster on the right really is, um, was made by a developer, um, a, a graphic designer on one of these campuses to say, okay, if you were to advertise PrEP to students on your campus, what would it look like? And that's, that's one of the products there. And that's the context that we can never bring with all of our expertise. And so we, um, um, I think the, the fact that we were willing to partner, collaborate, and be deferential to their knowledge of the local context, I think was ultimately beneficial. And so we, we wanted to take these concepts going forward, um, but also really get a sense for where they were in, in terms of like knowing about PrEP, but also like where, what, what risk perception was within that population and, and their overall interest in PrEP. And so this was a survey of a 210 students uh, collected over two of the four campuses we went to for this initiative, um, asking questions about PrEP. And I didn't um, lay out the entire um, survey here on this slide, but I think there are a couple of key points here that I wanted to um, just bring home. Um, so I think we all know, um, know, most of us on the call know that unfortunately young African Americans aged 18 to 29 are at the highest risk demographic for new HIV infections around the country. Um, that's exactly the demographic that you would capture on HIV, um, uh, uh, sorry, on, on historically um, black campuses. And so, um, and so we just surveyed a bunch of us and said, well, what, what do you think your risk for um, for um, HIV infection is and and surprisingly, to be um, to be honest, uh, almost three quarters of all of the respondents said they did not feel like they were at risk at all for HIV infection, which was striking. Um, you contrast that with the bottom question, which says um, express interest in at least one form of prep, and 69% of the students expressed interest in prep. And so there's that natural almost like cognitive dissonance. So um, one can say about like risk perception versus interest in, pre interest in um, prevention modalities. That's really interesting and, and one that we hope to capture in our customization efforts and our efforts to really design HIV prevention strategies um, and get really kind of deconstructed in a way that's, that's um, useful towards informing our messaging on these campuses going forward. Um, and so um, that's essentially the message um, they don't perceive themselves at risk, but they're increasingly aware and increasingly interested in PrEP, which is um, encouraging in and of itself. And so this work was mostly done over um, 2017 and 2018. And some, um, sometime in the, I believe in the end of 2017, we had our North Carolina PrEP Summit, the first ever North Carolina PrEP Summit that was hosted in conjunction with the Duke CFAR and the UNC CFAR as well. Um, it was hosted at the JB Duke Hotel in uh, in Durham, North Carolina, on the campus of Duke University. And um, it was at that summit that after I presented some of these prelim this preliminary work that I just showed y'all, um, Kenrick was in attendance. And Kenrick, again, is an is associate professor of pharmacy at South University, he was in the audience. And after I gave my talk, he pulled me to the side and was like, you know, um, I'm interested to kind of see if we can replicate this in South Carolina because I've done some work as, as, a, as a single entity on these campuses in South Carolina, and they would definitely benefit from some of the efforts that y'all have done, specifically the student engagement, the student health on campus provider training, and so can we partner? And of course, I was more than happy. I didn't know anything about South Carolina, but I knew Kenrick didn't, so I followed his lead going into um, this initiative. Um, and it turns out that this will ti is, is timely for reasons we'll talk about um, um, in a few slides. So uh, Kenrick um, told me in detail about his work, about um, the health care participation and really um, advocacy he was doing on uh, Voorhees College, which is one of the many um, um, historically black um, campuses in the state of South Carolina. Um, he got his students out there, they interacted, they educated students about PrEP. They did a lot of the same things that we were, we were doing here in North Carolina. And so um, we were really in, encouraged about this potential um, cross-border uh, collaborative between the North and South Carolina to really start to maximize um, dissemination onto these, um, onto the many HBCUs in the two states. Um, and so um, also there was also opportunities for informal mentorship. And so he, he did the very smart thing of coupling HIV um, prevention education to the patients 
with mentorship for potential aspirations in the healthcare profession as well, because I think everyone knows that we need more um, people of color, black and brown and other, to, um, in the health professions. I think that's well documented. And so the fact that Kemrick was able to couple this with his uh, interactions for HIV prevention um, was, uh, was genius, really. And so we said, you know, how, how can we kind of um, combine efforts and initiatives to make this something more powerful than what um, either one of us can do alone? And so um, he also um, invested in um, a PrEP ambassador group. And so similar to um, a, a initiative that we, um, I didn't really talk much about, um, was that we actually, um, in North Carolina, that some of the big campuses engaged in, in interested student health groups to really give them education for PrEP. And so similar to the Project SAFE that um, I briefly mentioned on at, at North Carolina Central, um, Kenrick um, started or was planned to start a program to look into PrEP ambassadors on the campus of Voorhees, for one, and then other campuses in the University of South Carolina, um, other campuses in the state of South Carolina going forward. Um, and that project, um, that project has not quite gotten off the ground, but the groundwork for that has, was done before the COVID pandemic hit. And so, I mean, I think we couldn't have found a better partner for um, expanding our efforts beyond our state borders than Kenrick. Um, and we're happy to. Um, uh, have collaborated with him over the last uh, three years. So here are some of the colleges that we were targeting. Um, um, South Carolina has many, um, many um, historically black colleges and universities. We spoke about Voorhees on the bottom left, but also Morris College of Sumter, South Carolina, Claflin, Benedict, and South Carolina State. Kenrick has uh, connections um, to at least uh, three or four of these campuses. And I think, um, as anyone knows, Relationship building is a large part of gaining the trust of, of um, people at African-American institutions. Um, there are many reasons why um, research initiatives are seen with skepticism on these campuses. And so having someone that's established and taking the time to build the relationships was key for us going forward. Um, now, in the interim, I also, a few months later, um, met with uh, Russell Campbell um, at this uh, conference that was held, I believe it was, um, mid-2017, and I have to get my dates correct. Um, and this, pla and this um, um, meeting was particularly interesting because it was an inter CFAR workshop on improving the partnerships between HBCUs and Centers for AIDS Research, um, really with an emphasis of CFARs located in the southeastern United States. And so this meeting was held in Nashville, Tennessee, we had a representative, it was held at, on the campus of Meharry University, one of only three historically black um, medical schools in the country. Um, and we sat down with leaders um, from these institutions, from their health professions programs, um, leaders at Meharry, leaders from um, the directors from the different CFARs. And we had a full day workshop talking about initiatives to improve collaboration between um, uh, HBCUs and um, CFAR investigators. Um, so, um, Russell gave his talk about his work um, at in Lincoln College as part of um, as a representative of the Legacy Project in Hank, um, looking at the engagement of HIV prevention and HIV prevention services by students on HBCU campuses. Lincoln is an HBCU located in, in Pennsylvania, and um, he did um, very good work there. He, he presented the talk, and I was like, you know, maybe we should talk and see what we can do together. Um, and also with an eye on leveraging the resources that the Hank could bring to to um, um, the effort, ongoing efforts um, being built by uh, myself and Kenrick. And so we, that's where I learned about the Legacy Project. Um, and just for point of clarification, the Legacy Project is a component of the, of the communication, I'm sorry, the, um, the community uh, collaboration section of the, of the HIV AIDS Network Coordination Center. And um, the Legacy Project uh, specifically has in mind strategic engagement, strategic uh, um, team building, um, and um, educational initiatives to enhance um, HIV prevention and uh, uh, treatment research um, and uh, implementation within uh, uh, underserved uh, um, um, communities. And so this partnership was square in their uh, mission statement in terms of like how they wanted to proceed to ensure that research, not just research, but really like cutting edge um, HIV implementation was penetrating um, key populations um, disproportionately affected by the HIV um, epidemic. 
And so, um, but I want to circle back to a point I made earlier, which was, uh, you know, the, the importance of letting the stakeholders be the experts, driving their knowledge and expertise in the local context to make content, to make um, to really drive and inform the messaging that's most effective and most poignant to the target populations we seek to reach. Um, and so we spoke um, here about this um, poster that was made by a graphic designer on the camp on one of the campuses we visited. And I think that concept of all things kind of stuck with me that, you know, at the end of the day, the students are the experts. And so we um, decided that whatever we did going forward would actually have a large component of kind of stakeholder driven expertise and customization of our of the message and we wanted to make that a central component of what we did in our partnership between myself Kenrick um, and the legacy project and so here is where um, um, we, we, we complemented each other in that unlike myself and Kenrick Russell and Hank already had the be the generation HIV prevention um, research module um, and it gave us something tangible to bring to the table in terms of finished um, educational product to start the conversation about um, of, of customization, of customizing um, material and messaging and advertising and educational content to the local context. And so the, the strategy would be to bring this module and say, hey, we want you guys to think up your own HIV prevention strategy here on Claflin or Benedict's campus or wherever. And here's a start. Take this, look through this, let's deconstruct this, and let's see how we can make this module better to fit your local context. And so, so um, obviously, Russell brought that to the table as the as the developer as, um, of the of HIV prevention module um, for Be the Generation. Um, and then, uh, of course, we talked about uh, Ken Rick's expertise um, in, um, in HIV prevention, but more importantly, his uh, uh, connections in South Carolina HBCUs in terms of HIV prevention and education. Um, and then my clinical expertise in HIV, infect, um, HIV infections, HIV specialist, but also my experience as my, and, and with my work in North Carolina's HBC, large HBCUs. And so the good thing is that we actually had experience, um, or I should say the Legacy Project had experience in customizing their module to um, different uh, groups. And so in this slide, this slide just kind of depicts how much they've already thought um, extensively about how to best present um, material to, to fit the local context and fit the target audience that they're being served. So here, I mean, see the, the sim symbolism of the, the bear claw and the medicine wheel that are um, resonate, that resonate with the Native American community. Um, and they've had sessions to really help develop ways to best present this material in a way that would actually um, hit this population. So Legacy Project has actually done a lot of this before, and we were just trying to extend these strategies to, um, to hit um, HBCUs and customize the material to their, to their context. And so um, it, was very, it was very beneficial and really um, encouraging when we heard that, you know, um, the Legacy is actually, um, has actually thought about um, doing these things and making things culturally um, um, appropriate and culturally, um, um, the cultural context uh, fit in for whoever we're trying to target. So that was very encouraging. Now, of course, I mean, I think most people on the call know about the end of HIV epidemic, the $291 million um, devoted um, to, towards uh, decreasing um, HIV infections by 2030. Um, and um, so here are the 48 jurisdictions in seven states on the 48 counties that, that represented 50% or approximately 50% of all new HIV infections around the country and seven states with uh, disproportional rural um, in, um, infections um, in their state. So more um, disproportionate uh, um, involvement of rural um, infections in rural areas within the states. Of course, it makes sense that most of the states are in the south with uh, rural southern blacks. Um, and um, of course, the map of HBCUs essentially um, mirrors the geography and the localization of, of these um, high-risk jurisdictions. And so I think this was an opportunity for us to really start to delve into that um, and the HIV epidemic space um, and hit strategic populations where we can get the most 
thank for our book for promoting HIV prevention. And so um, this is one of my last slides before I hand it off to Kenrick, but the goal in, in, in summary was to really get key stakeholder groups um, to the table to help customize um, the Be the Generation HIV prevention module. But really that was going to be a starting point for a larger conversation for a series of design consultation groups with stakeholders in the room to actually come up with a broader with a, the tenets for a broader HIV prevention message and strategy for their campuses. And so Be the Generation was was key, but we, we expected that HIV prevention strategies would go beyond just customization of the module when we had a series of meetings on these five campuses that we've mentioned. And, and we were going to use um, the tenets of a human-centered design, which is probably beyond the scope of this talk, um, but to really kind of help drive design thinking in a, in a systematic way to maximize creativity, to maximize um, iteration, reiteration, um, and trial and error on how we make patient-centered and really stakeholder-centered um, interventions that work best uh, for, for, for the people that we're trying to um, impact. And so um, I'll leave it there. I'll pass it off to Kenrick to give us um, a flavor of what this uh, Be the Generation HPR module looks like. Um, thank you. Thanks, Lance. So when we look here, delving into the Be the Generation module, obviously Lance talked a little bit earlier about in the survey of some of the college students about different options for prep that they would be more inclined to, to utilize. And so this slide just kind of gives us a flavor of what are some of the things that's coming down the pipeline when we start thinking about HIV prevention, HIV treatment, and so the, the Lead Generation uh, exploration will really look into empowering students about the, the opportunities that exist and really customizing those opportunities to different uh, groups on those college campuses. Next slide. So as was talked about a little bit earlier, when we're, when we're looking at Be the Generation, obviously we'll start with some of the fundamentals, making sure that, that students are clear on that distinction between HIV, a human immunodeficiency virus, and AIDS, or acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, uh, making sure that students understand the progression, as the slide says, from HIV to AIDS, and not uh, being careful about the terminology and not using them interchangeably, but hope you know, really, you know, with the focal point of helping students to realize that if someone uh, does come in contact with HIV and they uh, do start living with HIV, then the antiretrovirals or the medications can help to prevent progression to AIDS. And, and the, obviously, the more they take their medications, the more control their the HIV will, will become. Next slide. So when we look around the country, as, as Lance alluded to a little bit earlier in the presentation, obviously we know that when we think about HIV and AIDS, minority populations are disproportionately affected, which is why we endeavor to do this work with, between our two states. And, hope, and hopefully, as Lance mentioned, we can, we can extend out even, even, even farther than our states because there's a real need when we start thinking about some of our, our populations who attend historically black colleges and universities. And as we know, Lance alluded to a little bit earlier that he attended an historically black college and university, as did I uh, prior to my, my journey to pharmacy school. I attended an HBCU as well. And so we recognize the diversity and the, the rich diversity that's on these campuses of all these populations that you see listed here. And so if we can get a better handle on where, you know, where, our, where our students are and what their perspectives are, then as Lance mentioned, they can help us to drive some of these changes that we need to see. Next slide. So how is HIV transmitted? And so this is one of the things that uh, the Beta Generation Models will be we're really keen on is really dispelling some of the myths that, that students may have about transmission of HIV. And so obviously a lot of the, the misinformation is rooted in stigma and just really not having a good good handle on on um on hiv and the transmission process and i think that's why it's important as lance alluded to earlier to try to establish those ambassadors on campus and so that's been a focal point for me but obviously we need to empower our ambassadors to make sure that they have the appropriate information about hiv transmission before they can endeavor to speak about hiv prevention next slide so 
one of the things you want to be clear on is how is it transmitted? How is it not transmitted? And so there are a host of uh, just really just untruths about transmission of HIV and what and what happens on a college campus is that it, or in, in most places where you have you know a concentrated group of people is that this misinformation will travel very very quickly and it's even more amplified in our day and age now when we have the the, the continuing or the burgeoning of social media and how it impacts quite a few lives so we recognize that that misinformation is not only a problem from person to person but even in a virtual space when students will perhaps retweet something that's incorrect or reshare something on their on their social media platform so misinformation is 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 really detrimental not just again in 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 a personal conversations or face to face but definitely in a virtual space and now we know these things exist longer in those virtual spaces where people may screenshot them or take pictures of them to share with their friends so it's really important that we have a really good foundation with our with our students to help them to understand how HIV is and it's not transmitted so the 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 false narrative around HIV doesn't continue on beyond them uh, next slide so HIV prevention research so globally as 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 Lance alluded to really when we think about HIV prevention research we're really looking at it from a holistic perspective so our students again customizing the information as that was a a term that Lance continued to circle back to is how do we get our our community leaders and in all for all practical purposes our students on these college campuses are community leaders there they have uh, their spheres of influence in different areas whether it's in their social organization the athletic team that they're a part of or community work that they do so they are our community leaders in addition to obviously some of our more established community leaders at different organizations so it's really a it's a collective effort that exists among community leaders, uh, local and, and national organizations, health professionals, so having uh, physicians uh, on board such as lands, having pharmacists, nurses, all of us together really, really complete the team. And, and we're all having that educating component. So even uh, there with the Legacy Project, leveraging the amount of education they do in other capacities really helps us all to to really fully complete the HIV prevention research story. Uh, next slide. So how to prevent HIV. So again, we, as we have the advent of different antiretrovirals, different drugs that are available for, for prevention. So right now we have an oral option. And so in, in the future considerations, there may be injectables, there may be vaginal rings, but we can't, we can't dispense with condoms. And so that was, those are something that we want to really discuss with, with students through this be the generational, uh, be the generation model is while where it is more and more emphasis being placed on some of the pharmacological aspects of things, there's definitely room for education and family planning, needle exchange programs that will complement some of the medications that are coming down the pipeline for HIV prevention. And testing and counseling is important too because we want to make sure that people are are still negative or living without HIV prior to getting HIV prevention. So uses for antiretroviral drugs, one of the considerations here is we recognize that if if we have people who perhaps are in serodiscordant or perhaps one person is living with HIV, another person is not living with HIV. So Pre-exposure prophylaxis becomes a huge point there for the person that's not living with HIV, so they can um, enjoy their relationship with the person that's living with HIV with a decreased risk of themselves actually coming to live with HIV. So there are different options here when we think of treatment as prevention. Obviously, that's treating the, the person living with HIV to get the viral load in the system as low as possible to really decrease the risk of transmitting uh, HIV to the person that's not living with HIV. It's the element of even family planning that we talked about with pregnancies. You know, how do we ensure that a mother who's living with HIV, how do we ensure that her unborn child does not come to live with HIV? So that's a big effort with when we start thinking about antiretroviral drugs. And that's solely really attributed to how the mother, the viral load in the mother's system is really a, a huge factor there. And pre-exposure pre prophylaxis and post-exposure prophylaxis 
particularly from a post-exposure prophylaxis perspective, really understanding the time frame that people will have to adhere to the regimen. So it's a, a pretty short window, typically within about three days, we would want people to, to adhere to this post-exposure prophylaxis regimen and take it for about a month. So those type of educational opportunities are things that the beta generation module is looking to really customize and not make it so scientifically dense, but help students to understand and help them to be able to explain the information at, at their level so they can pass it along to their peers. Next slide. So this toolbox really just encompasses everything that we've discussed about HIV prevention. So as you can see, it's a lot of different tools in this toolbox and we all play a role in, in making sure that HIV prevention is, is a reality and it's an ongoing reality towards, as Lance talked about, really that end of the epidemic uh, charge that we all have in our different respects is HIV prevention is a huge, a huge component of that. So it's going to take assistance from the medical community, behavioral, physical barriers. It's going to take social support. It's going to take all hands on deck to really make sure that we can truly end the epidemic. Next slide. So that alludes a little bit earlier. These are some of the, when we start thinking about the, the, the future, the pipeline, what does prevention look like moving forward? So there are different options available, as I stated, with their vaginal rings being studied, uh, their injectable products that will perhaps make it easier for, for people to adhere to their medication regimen as opposed to maybe a, taking one pill every day, perhaps it's an injection every month, every two months. And so those things give people a lot of flexibility, but obviously they're not without their own shortcomings. We have to make sure that people remember to take the injection once a month or once every two months. So sometimes it may be difficult to take something every day, but it may be a, another set of challenges to take it every month or every two months. So that's where we come in and we come in as healthcare professionals and as community leaders to really give, give advice and give strategies for helping people to be, to be adherent. Next slide. So here, when we start thinking about uh, when we look at globally, uh, all Americans diagnosed with HIV, only 50% of viral suppressed. So we're really talking one or two people are not, right? So if they're, if they're not virally suppressed, as we, I'm sure, fully are aware that their chances of transmitting the, the virus to someone else is pretty, is pretty, per, are pretty high. And so our responsibility is to obviously to, to diagnose, right? You, you can't solve the problem if you don't know the problem is this. So in, to, to, to diagnose, and once we diagnose, then how do we get them involved in their own care, participant in their own care? And so linking them to care is, is critical and not just linking them, but the next, uh, the next part I think is just as important is keeping them in care. So once you get them linked, how do we keep them engaged? I think modules such as this was are empowering to help people to, to, stay, to stay in care. So not just link, but to remain in care and not to fall out of care. And actually once they're there, how do we, you know, customize the regimen that they may need, the antiretroviral therapy regimen that they may need. And, and, and a, lot, a lot of that is, you know, making sure that the regimen is financially friendly, that, you know, people can afford to take the medications. We know the best medications are the, the ones people take and that financial barriers are real barriers. And so making sure people have, you know, an opportunity to, to fully adhere to their antiretroviral therapy regimen without the, the concern of being you know, of being bankrupt or, or, or spending all their money on their on their regimen because we know people have other other needs, other concerns in life, whether it's you know paying you know rent or car payments or things of that nature. So we all have things to contend with outside of our outside of our medica medication needs, and so that's an important aspect. Ultimately, to get to the place of viral suppression, to to increase that number from fifty percent. To, to quite a bit higher, to gradually to 60 and 70 and 80. And hopefully we, it, it, we get to a point where everyone who is following along this cascade will become virally suppressed. Next slide. So I'll turn it back over to Lance here. And so we'll just kind of give, he'll just kind of talk a little bit about where we are obviously with the current climate, with the pandemic and how we're looking to move things along. Oh, yeah, thank you, Cameron, for that. And so these last slides are to kind of wrap up um, our, our presentation. Um, at the time of the pandemic, uh, 
really kind of hit in the United States. So we were actually geared up for our design pilot sessions at South University, uh, which is Kendrick's home institution. Um, we had our stakeholders scheduled and ready to go. We had our room booked and we had everything. And then right there in the third week of March, um, everything shut down. And I think the world has turned up that, uh, upside down since. And so we have to halt our activities. And um, of course, we are halted indefinitely from, uh, from in-person meetings and really trying to reimagine what this would look like virtually. And like, do we get the same bang for our buck and the same kind of creative energy flowing to help custom, customize a module that um, the camera just present, presented, but really get creative and expansive about, about um, building an HIV prevention strategy going forward on Zoom or a similar platform. And so that, those are all questions that are left to be answered. It's an, of course an unfortunate event that we, it was way out of our control. Um, but we are looking to kind of convert virtually and hopefully um, hit some of the um, highlights that we were intending to when we first conceived this project. And so what are the role of virtual sessions? We'll find out in the fall of 20, the 2021 school year. So here are some HBCU engagement resources available for the group and contact info for all the collaborators on this project. I want to give special thanks out to Russell and Louis um, as well, who you'll hear from in the question and answer section after this. Um, and Kenrick, um, uh, thank you for your um, for your collaboration and, and continue to look forward to work um, working with you going forward. Um, our email addresses are here in case uh, um, anyone is interested in, in, in helping out. You know, this is unfortunately because of the timeline the pandemic has set for us still in this relatively early uh, implementation phase. And so, anyone that's interested, feel free to um, reach out to any of us to kind of go um, to um, come up with ideas to make this bigger and better. Um, so I want to thank you for your time, and we'll stop there for questions.